morning. And welcome to Ebenezer United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we're just really glad you are here. Friends, today is a, a wonderful and extraordinary day because it's a gift from God. And even more so, this morning, we are so excited and honored to welcome uh, the Reverend Daniel Cooperwriter, who is the author of Speak with the Earth and It Will Teach You. Our book study group uh, read that and just was, we were blown away by not only this this, this man, he's a writer, and he's a, a teacher and a pastor, and he brings all of these things together in his writing in the most, as Charlie would say, exquisite way. So we welcome him this morning. We are grateful that he has made the journey here, and we are looking forward to your message today. Now, friends, as we center ourselves to experience the presence of the holy among us, May these words from the distinguished poet, Mary Oliver, stir our imaginations to an awareness of the sacred that is all around us. It was spring, and I finally heard him among the first leaves. Then I saw him clutching the limb in an island of shade with his red-brown feathers, all trim and neat for the new year. First, I stood still and thought of nothing. Then I began to listen. Then I was filled with gladness, and that's when it happened. When I seemed to float, to be myself, a wing or a tree. And I began to understand what the bird was saying. And the sands in the glass stopped for a pure, white moment, while gravity sprinkled upward, like rain rising, and in fact, it became difficult to tell just what it was that was singing. It was the thrush for sure, but it seemed not a single thrush, but himself and all his brothers, and also the trees around them, as well as the gliding long-tailed clouds in the perfect blue sky. All of them were singing. And of course, so it seemed, so was I. Such soft and solemn and perfect music doesn't last for more than a few moments. It's one of those magical places wise people like to talk about. One of the things they say about it that is true is that once you've been there, you're there forever. Listen, everyone has a chance. Is it spring? Is it morning? Are there trees near you? And does your own soul need comforting? Quick then, open the door and fly on your heavy feet. The song may already be drifting away. Praise be to God for the gift of creation and the gift of people whose brilliance is able to be expressed so beautifully. So now we invite you to please join responsibly, my friends, as we are called to this time of worship. Good morning. For the earth's cycles and seasons, for the rising of spring and the growing summer, for autumn's fullness and the hidden depths of winter, thanks be to you, O Christ. For the life force in seeds buried in the ground that shoot green and bear fruit and fall to the earth, thanks be to you, O Spirit. For the earth who models birth and rebirth, death and dying with natural beauty. Thanks be to you, O God. Let us learn from the earth's cycles of birthing and the times and seasons of dying. Let us learn of you and the soil of our souls, of your journey through the death to birth. Let us learn of you in our soul this morning, 
and the ancient journey of letting go. Amen. Uh, join us in singing together to you, O God, all creatures sing. Please join me in praying. In the beginning, you, O oh God, worked the soil, forming and planting and teaching us how to care for the earth. In the beginning, 
your compassion created community, and you offered all that is good and invited us to trust. We pray that you make today a new beginning, O oh God. Work the soil of our hearts by hand, form and plant and teach, shape us into your compassionate community, and give us, we pray, the courage to accept your invitation to live good and right relationship with each other and all of creation. The scripture reading today comes from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a champion runs its course with joy. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandment of the Lord is radiant, giving light to the eyes. The reverence of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for offering to share your gifts as liturgist. Your presence today was amazing. All right, my friends, if I could have the youngest people among us to please come forward for our time together, I would appreciate it. Good morning, India. One of these things is not like the other. Oh, look at you, ABR. Only oh, boy. So, how many of you were in Sunday school today? All right, okay. So on Wednesday mornings, there's a group of us that meet, and it's on Wednesdays, but it's like Sunday school for grown-ups. We meet for Bible study. And we were talking about and learning more about the scripture that you just heard, Psalm 19 this morning. And that little part at the end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be, be pleasing to you, O God, right? A lot of times we hear that when um, a guest pastor comes, they might start preaching, right? Right before they, they start sharing the sermon, they'll say those words like, please, oh God, it's like a prayer, right? May what I say bring honor and glory to you, right? And may, we hope it makes you happy, right? And as we were thinking about it, we're like, you know what? That could be a prayer that all of us say every day when we leave the house. May, may what's in my head and what's in my heart, God, May it be good things, because what's in my head and what's in my heart often pops out of my mouth, right? Right? And it comes out in the things that we do, how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we don't treat one another nicely, right? If we have all those things in our hearts and in our minds, those things will come out. So, so praying every day to, before you leave the house, oh, God, let me be kind. Let me, let me have good thoughts and let me hold good things in my heart and say good and nice things to other people because that'll make you happy. We know that that'll make God smile. So it got me thinking. As we were talking about this, um, when your parents drop you off somewhere, what do they say to you? Mm -hmm. Have a good day. Have a good day. Awesome. Uh-huh. I'll miss you. Oh, my gosh. Uh -huh. And I love you. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Try not to get in trouble. <laughs> there you go. See? I love that. I love that. 
So, like a long time ago, while we were in Bible study, oh, did you have one? Be respectful. Very good, Hazel. Oh my gosh. So, when we were in Bible study and we were talking about this, something came to my mind that I hadn't thought of for like 30 years. There was, um, I went to drop one of my kids off. Might have been your dad, AVR. Um, went to drop them off, and I, I'm almost positive it was a birthday party at McDonald's. So it was somebody's birthday at McDonald's. We were dropping them off for the party. And in our family, a lot of times when you drop somebody off, you give them a hug and say, I love you. And depending upon where they're going, have a good day if they're going to school, you know, play nice with the other kids, be kind, be respectful, all that stuff. And there was someone that was dropping their child off who gave their child a hug and bent down and looked them right in the eye and said, remember you are stardust, go shine. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Go shine. Shine kindness, shine love, be respectful, right? Try not to get in trouble. But yeah, all of you, all of you that is precious and dazzling and brilliant, shine all that goodness in you into the world and have the best time. So I pray, my friends, that you remember that you are precious and you are loved by God always more than you can possibly imagine. And remember, you are stardust. So go shine. Amen. All right, friends. I would love to meet you back at that table. We'll get you set up with snacks or whatever you need. And the rest of us are going to please stand if you are able. You can rise in body or spirit as we join together in singing ground and source of all that is.
Good morning. It's really a great joy and honor for me to get to join here with you this morning on this newest day of God's creation. So thank you to um, Pastor Lori for the invitation. And thank you all for welcoming me into this um, beautiful space and welcoming community that you all have here. It's special for me to get, get to be back a bit um, next to the big lake, Lake Michigan. Um, in a former life, I lived for eight years in Chicago, very close to the lake, um, which is where I went to college and seminary. Um, so it's wonderful to get to be back to um, commune a bit here on, are we, do we call it the east coast of Wisconsin? Or I heard somebody call it the Malibu of the Midwest, <laughs> which I originally had dreams of taking that communion with the lake, a step towards doing a cold plunge in the lake, but with the snowflakes this morning, we'll have to see about that. I did not bring a wetsuit. I am, um, Lori mentioned this in the wonderful sermon on Psalm 19 we've already heard, but I am one of those preachers who often begins a sermon with the prayer that ends Psalm 19. Um, my spouse, Julia, also, she's a pastor of Orchard Ridge UCC in Madison. Um, they also have a 10 a.m. worship, so she, I imagine her maybe standing up to preach right about now. Um, and we have a three-year-old who I'm sending a quick prayer is thoroughly enjoying the nursery um, care room at this moment. But she often does begin with a riff on that preacher's prayer. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you, O God. Reading back towards the beginning of the psalm, there's a little detail that shines bright for me and that I like to think about and turn over in my mind. That's that little image, that little detail, the sun described as running its daily course with joy. And I, I do love thinking about that. Joy is not something optional or external to life, like the cherry on top of life, uh, but joy is something that's built into the very nature and way of things. Joy as a natural part of the world as the way of the sun. Continuing to read back, though, um, those stunning first verses. I have found myself wondering recently, or to use a nice phrase that one of my pastoral mentors would often use, um, she said it came from her Pennsylvania Dutch language and culture. Rather than saying, I wonder, she would often say, it wonders me, it wonders me. It wonders me how might a sermon be heard differently if the preacher were to say, rather than begin with those last words, the prayer at the end, what if the preacher were to stand up and clear their throat and say with as much boldness and clarity they could muster, like with Melissa's wonderful reading, those first verses, the heavens are telling the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of God's hands, day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. Beginning there with those words, they act to remind me that it's really not just me as an individual right now who is preaching with you, but I invite us to maybe take a step back and remember and see again how really it is God's entire creation that's the ongoing revelation. Life itself, a type of sermon that's forever being preached and forever preaching. And so as I like to imagine it, um, what's happening between me and you right now Maybe it's just as natural a part of this day's sermon, this day's gospel, this day's good news, as the, um, the other um, exciting early signs of new life happening on the landscape as we head in a couple days here into the spring equinox. So I'm coming to you today from the Madison landscape, landscape of inland lakes, um, where right around this time of year, um, the robins and red-winged blackbirds are back in full force, bringing their cheery songs with them. So too, the wild geese, sandhill cranes, calling, bugling overhead. So too, at dusk, the duets of owls, if we should be so lucky as to live in their neighborhoods. These are the sounds of life seeking more life. 
And right about now, among the leaf duff on the forest floor are the first snowdrops and hepatica. Um, they might seem like the most delicate flowers of the year, yet there must be some real deep strength and hardiness to them, being the first ones to come up after the snow and ice. And also on the forest floor, this past week in the woods, I paused and I heard my very first chorus of wood frogs. And their story, you might know, is quite amazing. They survive winter by intentionally letting themselves freeze. They produce a type of glucose that prevents, their, prevents cell damage. They completely stop breathing. They, their heart stop. Uh, brain activity completely ceases. Um, until right about now, right about this time of year, something triggers those little frog hearts to beat again. And the frogs thaw from the inside out. And within hours, they're up and about, leaping, seeking their mates, and singing. As Pastor Lori mentioned in the introduction, I was invited here because I'm the author of a book connecting spirituality and nature that I'm very grateful some of you have been engaging with um, this past year. So I'm grateful to get to try to speak to the main theme of that book with you this morning. As a path into it, I want to honor and give voice for a second to the lands who raised me. I take that from one of my favorite questions these days to pose to small groups. Tell me about the land who raised you. One of those lands is a small um, group of family cabins in northwest Wisconsin. I was fortunate enough to get to spend every summer of my life at, and some winters too, and to live close enough to visit now within every season. Many of the same species as here. This is a land of white pine, aspen, birch, maple, leopard frogs, snapping turtles, eagle, heron, bass, pike, trout, um, cattail, lily pad, and tamarack bogs, and as I'm sure you know, um, plenty of ticks and mosquitoes too. And it is a place, as I like to picture it in my mind's eye, in the summer, the orange Moon rises across the dark lake while loons wail back and forth. Night to night, as our psalmist puts it, declares knowledge. The other land who raised me were the, was the woods and rivers of Northeast Ohio, the Lake Erie watershed, um, particularly the Chagrin River Valley. I grew up just a bit upstream from where poet Mary Oliver grew up from that we heard from to start the service. This is where I went to school the rest of the year. Um, and being part of the millennial generation, any other millennials out there? Um, when I think about my environmental education in particular, it tends to have focused around key um, aspirational, uh, big, big, heavy words like save and protect. So our generational references weren't necessarily Rachel Carson's Silent Spring or the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland catching fire. Uh, but for us, it was the movie Free Willy and Save the Whales. Um, and it was Fern Gully and Protect the Rainforest. Um, first it was Panda Bear, but then it was Polar Bear. It was Language of Global Warming, and then it was Climate Change. Um, and now we have new terminology entering the culture. Uh, climate chaos, tipping points, warmest years on record. Maybe some of you saw the news. Wisconsin, month of February was a full 16 point something degrees, warmer than quote unquote normal. We have now some of the, the feelings, maybe mental health challenges that can come with this. Um, eco grief, climate anxiety, nature deficit disorder, the sense of living in the six mass extinction event, species loneliness, um, soul nostalgia. That's a new word coined recently. It means not longing for a different time and place like nostalgia, um, but longing for what your own time and place, uh, your own homeland has become after being ecologically changed. changed. Soul nostalgia. May the words of my mouth. A few landscapes later, I, uh, my first call was as a pastor of a rural church in Vermont in the Northeast. I was eager to try to connect to these environmental concerns with my pastoral vocation. 
but I was trained with quite an academic um, sense of things to really think my job as preacher was to be primarily an interpreter of, of the written word, written text. Um, I went to that school that has their motto, where fun comes to die, maybe you know that one. <laughs> So each week, I would turn to the lectionary, read those assigned texts. I would read commentaries on those texts. I would read commentaries on those commentaries. After a few years, though, I realized the congregation I was with was really engaged in a, a bit of a different type of reading. So Sunday mornings, I would stand up and announce the lectionary. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, or today, and this is the case, is the fifth Sunday of Lent. I then open the microphone, invite folks to share joys, celebrations. Today, I celebrate my first bluebird sighting, meaning today was the sun, first Sunday of true spring. This week, I took a drive through the mountains, and the fall colors were spectacular, meaning today is the Sunday of peak leaves. So while I was so focused on the liturgical calendar, this congregation slowly taught me about what's called the phenological calendar, calendar of when things happen on the landscape, and that as a spiritual community, we could read for God in, the, in that calendar too, and in the cycle of nature's happenings. Our psalmist says, day to day pours forth speech. I realized during my time there, if I were to make the Bible come alive in such an ecologically attuned community, um, I wanted to try out some new ways of interpreting it. And Jewish rabbinic tradition gives us a wonderful image for this. They like to talk about the Bible as like a family heirloom gem, like a diamond that's passed down generation to generation. And when we have it for the time being, our task when we read it is to turn the gem. You can picture turning a diamond in a, certain, a new way. It reflects light in new ways. So what might we see if we turn the Bible radically towards the earth? So turn it away from focusing only on maybe the human characters and drama, as I think we've had a couple thousand years now of quite good biblical scholarship. But what if we turned it towards that more than human world of trees, mountains, rivers, clouds, um, which became the themes and sections of my book? So just to speak to one with you this morning, what might trees in the Bible have to say when we read things from their perspective? There's a wonderful story about um, Abraham and Sarah. Their favorite spot to camp in the book of Genesis was underneath the oak trees of Mamre. They returned to these oak trees again and again. Genesis chapter 18 tells a story of a particularly hot day. Three strangers are passing by and they rush out to those strangers and welcome them back underneath the shade of those oak trees. And they provide for them the most lavish feast they have access to. This is um, the foundational story of, of hospitality in our tradition. Um, in Judaism, in Christianity, um, Jesus places himself right in this lineage. That great saying of his, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was hungry and you fed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. It's a foundational story in um, Islam as well, and we can um, keep in our prayers to their Muslim siblings uh, entering the month of Ramadan this past week. But as I looked into it, I was surprised to find this story of Abraham and Sarah welcoming the strangers under the oak tree shows up three different times in the Quran. Such an important story. So what if I ask in the book, what if Abraham and Sarah learned something about radical hospitality, rad generous welcome directly from those oak trees? The more you look into it, oak trees happen to be the very species of tree that does host the most biodiversity, that is a type of master of hospitality. So what if we too, like Abraham and Sarah, took up again a learning posture trying to learn again from all the expressions of nature, trees, mountains, rivers, clouds, uh, 
turning to a tree, say, as a, a spiritual director, a mentor for us during one season of our spiritual life. So speak with the earth and it will teach you. The title uh, of my book comes from a verse from the book of Job, but really more than a title and more than a book, what I hope this notion of speak with the earth and me um, sharing it with you today, what I hope it does is invite um, an attitude and an orientation that I've been sensing more and more being called for at this time for us humans, this um, species moment, as I've heard it described for us on this planet. So I mentioned save and protect. I used to maybe think along those lines that our earth was ours to save and protect. I now see it, or I'm starting to see it more along the lines of earth not being ours, but we belonging to the earth. So I see it our job not only to love the earth, but to take the time to notice and appreciate and give thanks and praise for the way earth loves us. I want to invite you to consider this thought with me. I invite you to consider the notion that life on this planet could, you know, very well go on without us humans. Thank you very much. Um, and yet, here, here we are. And yet, here we are. So I take from that that the earth does not need us, but the earth wants us. Take from that, um, the earth does not need us, but the earth makes us and evolves us to be here. The earth does not need us, but the earth in its way loves us. I now see, again, along those lines, nature not so much as ours to save, but nature playing its role in saving us. When we remember again that ancient wisdom, we are nature, we are earth, we belong to the whole. So for myself, I've been trying to, um, trying to think about a way of relating to the earth that I've been calling for myself radical earth empathy. And by that, I mean trying to sense more and more that maybe the climate fear and anxiety we can feel in our bodies is the fear and anxiety that the forests feel, say, in California, Hawaii, Greece, Texas, as the wildfires approach. The loneliness we can feel is the loneliness of the white rhino facing extinction. But so, too, the joy we can feel and can't help but feel is the joy of the sun running its daily course. It's the joy of that red-winged blackbird with its spring is coming trill. And it's the joy of those frozen wood frogs who thaw from the inside out. And the first thing they do, they sing. So indeed this morning, may these words of my mouth, um, may they be a type of inspiration and blessing to you as you go about uh, speaking with the earth in the unique ways that each of you do. And when you're brought to that place beyond words, as our encounters with God's love is made known in nature so often do, bringing us to the, that place beyond words, may those meditations of your heart be attuned to that great sermon again of life, forever preaching, forever being preached. Because no matter what else is happening or no matter where you are, no matter where you find yourself, it's always the case that the heavens are telling the glory of God and the skies are proclaiming the work of God's hands. Amen. Oh, Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, some good news this morning as we approach this time of, of sharing our gifts, right, of what we offer. Um, he will, he's starting to write another book. So for those of us who thoroughly enjoyed the first one, we'll look forward to that second one. So friends, I would ask that you please join your voice with mine as we are invited to this moment to be grateful and generous. God has created us with the capacity to do incredible things. In this world full of ache and loss, we have the ability to be healers, to hold grief, to create beauty, 
to tell the truth, to find joy even in times of suffering. So we gather these sacred gifts and all our offerings, trusting that God can do great and renewing things with them and us. Friends, we know that here at Ebenezer United Church of Christ, we give our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings in a number of different ways. Some of us give through automatic giving, some use the website, others the Dropbox, and still others share their offerings in worship. If you would prefer to share your offering um, today, please note that there are offering plates at each of the exits of the sanctuary. And as we dedicate our one great hour of sharing offerings this morning, Please note that if you were like, oh, I was going to do that, I was going to do that this week, we're receiving that offering through the end of the month before we send that into the Wisconsin Conference. So we dedicate what has been shared and what will be given, knowing that the Spirit blesses all of those things. So please join me, stand and join me as we respond musically to the gifts that we receive and the gifts that we offer. in a spirit of dedication and commitment, we pray together um, the prayer of Jesus as translated by a Nez Pierce elder. Together we pray, O oh great spirit, you are our shepherd chief in the most high place whose home is everywhere, even beyond the stars and moon. Whatever you want done, let it be done everywhere. Give us your gift of bread day by day. Forgive our wrongs as we forgive those who wrong us. Take away from wrongdoings. Free us from all evil, for everything belongs to you. Let your power and glory shine forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, friends, as we take a moment to focus on our life together. If you have an announcement or acknowledgement, I would ask that you please come forward at this time. I want to extend a huge, a massive, and heartfelt thank you to everyone who participated in any way in the 4-in-1 fundraiser here at Ebenezer, that fundraiser that ended yesterday, between just people bringing items and continuing to make hot and fresh egg rolls, and that rummage sale team just... I, I can't even begin to describe to you uh, just all of what they share um, to, for special projects here at the church. Um, I, I just, it's so much time, and they do it so generously, and they share friendship and laughter and genuine welcome to anyone who walks through the door during the week for any number of things. So thank you. Thank you. Our last Lenten luncheon is going to be this Wednesday at noon, so we invite anyone who wants to come for that potluck time um, that begins at noon on Wednesdays. Janice. Good morning. Julie has asked to thank all of those who helped with egg rolls, whether you sold them, whether you made them, whether you bought them or ate them. Um, <laughs> there were 10,514 egg rolls made. So thank you all for putting up for the lovely aroma of egg rolls in the building. Um, but we did from the carrot ends feed the horses and from the onion skins we fed the pigs and um, we did our level best. Uh, even the oil gets recycled. Thank you, Todd. Um, 
And though, as Lori mentioned, the, the egg roll money has helped to fund any number of non-budgeted items, uh, things like the mission trip and helping pay for the shed and a roof on the house next door, uh, some, a good portion of the parking lot. Um, I think the next big project is a lawn tractor that needs to be replaced. <laughs> so, um, and we do have a few bags of egg rolls left. We have pork and we have veggie some carrots and some onions. So if anybody wants to buy any of those things, and we're experimenting with special sauce, uh, like a dipping sauce, a sweet sour sauce. Okay, that that's better. At I, experimenting with sauce, I'm like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> well, sometimes there's a little of that. But um, after a long day of egg rolls. <laughs> <laughs> but so sweet and sour sauce if anybody wants to try it and then we'll see if it's worth selling next year. So thank you all. Thanks, Janice. Yep. Uh, um, okay, so Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at 6.30, the movie Ordinary Angels begins. We have a private showing um, for us at Marcus Theater here in Sheboygan. If you signed up for that, um, you can come to the theater starting at about 10 after 6. You need to see me because I need to mark that off. Uh, we want to make sure that we're paying for everyone who goes in. It's $5. It's just $5. And I'll take, you know, you just hand that to me. I will have some change. Julie put together a change purse for me from the egg roll money that everyone so generously <laughs> donated toward. Um, I, I've gotten a few um, text messages and phone calls uh, this week and today. So if you forgot to sign up, if you're coming and your neighbor, your child, whoever wants to go with you, it's like, um, I will go to the theater this afternoon. <laughs> My goodness. Um, I can go to the theater this afternoon and just say, hey, can you accommodate this? They really want to know for concessions and those types of things. Uh, you work with someone out of Milwaukee to set up this event. So I'll go to Sheboygan and go, hey, we're going to be a few more. But I really would like to know if you're coming so that we can just, um, we, can, we can genuinely give them a heads up about who's all going to be there. Right now, we're like over 70 people. And so we will be in the largest theater they have. So um, also... Um, Donna Robley, Swin Robley has been doing an amazing job putting together um, music for the pop-up choir that's going to share their gifts on the April 14th and April 28th. The music is so beautiful. And if you're like, oh, I, I love to sing, but uh, I don't know. I have a choir voice all day long. You don't want to hear me sing. But mixed with other people, it, it, it really is just a wonderful experience. So um, if you look at your Ebenezer update, they're all of the rehearsal dates, and there's a number of them, um, so you can come when you can, are in there, and we would love to have your voice and your presence be a part of that pop-up choir. And we are selling chicken dinner tickets this morning. Well, Carolyn and Jan Free are going to be at the comic counter, so if you haven't had a chance to to purchase your chicken dinner tickets yet for the chicken dinner, which is that first Sunday of May, uh, please do so. We would certainly appreciate that. So friends, uh, please, please stand and let's join our voices together as we share the friend's benediction. <laughs> teach you. Delight in sitting in the grass, playing in the dirt, and connecting with the earth like a treasured sibling. Dance. Dance with the raindrops unabashedly that you may be soaked in sacredness. And remember, beloved of God, you are stardust. Go and shine. Be a blessing to the world in all the ways you can. Amen.